Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic. I feel energized. I am drinking coffee out of this wonderful mug. Yeah, you know, I am drinking tea out of a wonderful mug here. And can you read what that says, Dr. D? Yeah, yeah. It, it says expensive degree that nobody will ever use. Uh, <laughs> liberal arts education. <laughs> For those who are not on YouTube, it says Williams College, which is really important because it is a link to our guest today. Would you like to introduce our guest? Would you like me to introduce I would, our guest? I would love to. Our guest, our guest is a man who is yearning for a bigger coffee cup. And Chuck, maybe as we go back to the swag bag, uh, we would look at bigger cups. But uh, you know, Steve Moran is coming back to the pod. So Steve, welcome back. Uh, as you all know, he is a world famous uh, hand and wrist surgeon um, and plastic surgeon at Mayo Clinic. And he is second in line to the ASSH presidency. And so we're honored to have Steve back. We had a riveting discussion before on Keenbox disease. So now we're here to talk about the next level of treatment of Keenbox, so to say. Guys, thanks for having me back. I'll tell you, you're, thank you for what you're doing. Your podcast has taken off. My residents and fellows are all talking about it. And then I see a lot of... Uh, positive vibes coming off the listserv. So I think you guys are doing something great. And I know it's a lot of work. So thank you for doing it. Thank you. I, you know, Chris, I don't know that I share with you, but uh, I was recently with Steve, one of his other accolades, and there's many, we can get into a few more, is that he is on the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Um, and there recently was a question writing session, which might to the listeners sound like the most boring use of one's time ever. But it's actually super fun. Um, and it was good to see people and interact with people. But that's yet another accomplishment. But at this meeting, Steve was very clear to say that he believes what put us over the edge, so to speak, was the previous podcast on Keenbox. And, and we were middling around not doing much exciting. And when that podcast dropped, all of a sudden, there we went. Do you think that's true, Chris? I actually was about to quit until that episode came out. And, you know, the fan mail was ridiculous. And I got asked to sign a bunch of uh, podcast mugs. Just people started coming out of the woodwork. So it's funny you speak about question writing. I'm very proud. We had a plastic surgery resident uh, rotating on our service recently. And she spent some time with me. And uh, we were talking about anatomy during the case. And I kept asking our resident, uh, this plastic surgery resident, um, and our fellow, because they were all rotating in and out of a long case, the origin of the lump of the lumbricals and nobody was getting it right. I was like, guys, this shows up every time on the in-service, blah, blah, blah. Well, the plastic surgery in-service was uh, a couple of weekends ago and she nailed it because it was on the in-service. We talked about how it came off of the FDP and she was so happy. I was like, if, at the very least, if you learn something, you got one question right on your in-service because of me. I love it. It is a labor of love writing those questions. It's a, uh... I wouldn't say it's the most uh, scintillating thing that uh, we do, but but it is an important job. But I'm sure that you, um, now that we're hopefully emerging from um, the worst parts of the pandemic, uh, you at least get to connect, right? And I think that's probably one of the best things about doing stuff like that and doing oral boards and all that kind of stuff, right? It was great to be able to see everybody again. I mean, it's been forever. I think that was the best part of the meeting for sure. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I um, I wasn't... You know, I can be social at times and other times I'm quite content and, and there's lots of, there's lots of, there's lots of. I don't know research. what kind of psychopath stuff that just was, Chuck. <laughs> well, he's introvert. He's just an introvert. There's nothing wrong with that. There's been a lot of research out there about introverts, which I don't know that I'm really an introvert, but introverts during the pandemic kind of were like, okay, things are fine. But I will say for those of you listeners who have not yet been back to a meeting of any kind and Zoom does not count at all. If you have not physically been to a meeting, it is, it's really hard to put into words how, how good it was just to see and interact with people. And it, it was awesome. I was super excited and it was even better than I thought it was going to be. And you know, I was sitting in a room talking about orthopedic questions or sorry, hand surgery questions all day. It was good. Hopefully the annual meeting will be a hundred times better. I'm sure it will. Steve, before we before we jump in on the topic of choice, um, can you tell us what it's like to now be in line for the presidency for the Hans Society? It's an incredible accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, it's an incredible honor. 
And, um, you know, quite sincerely, I belong to a lot of different societies. And there is really, I really don't think there's any other society like the ASSH. I, I think, you know, Chuck, probably, you probably say the same thing. The things that the Hand Society has given to me, I don't think I can pay back. The time that they've given me, like, for example, the Banal and visiting uh, professors all over the world and really learning so much uh, to take better care of my patients is really special. The uh, leadership line and the administrative staff are exemplary. And so I think just being exposed to a lot of other societies and groups, I really think it's just something, it's where I wanna spend my time, it's where I wanna give my money. So I think that that's uh, the best part about it. Yeah, that's well, that's well said. Uh time and money. And that that's right. I did, it does, um, as an organization, it does give me far more than other organizations. Uh, it's funny, I, I believe I directly uh, followed you in the Bunnell, um Award. And we both, I think maybe it was maybe it wasn't directly. But anyways, I, I followed you because you're a lot older than me. And um, <laughs> but I have, a, I have a, more hair, Chuck. That's all look at this. Hair. I got guys. I got, y'all, y'all need to log into YouTube and check out the hair on these guys. <laughs> so, but um, we both uh, vi- visited Stephen Hovius, who's a remarkable plastic surgeon who uh, focuses on kids uh, in Rotterdam, and and uh, Steve had shared this remarkable video um, where uh, Stephen, uh, you know, drove, you know, biked you to work on the back of his bicycle kind of put you sat on the back and it, it looked harrowing and then I did the same thing but I knew about it before I got there so it wasn't as as harrowing as your experience was it, it's kind of, I don't I don't like to share this story uh but you know I was a little heavier back then Chuck and when we in that video when we go over <laughs> the bump I bent his tire and <laughs> <laughs> we made it to the restaurant but he could not make it home and he had to like carry his bike home it was a <laughs> sad thing like he had a bike repairman come to the hospital next day to fix it that's how important uh, bike transportation is in Rotterdam but that was a good that was a good wake-up signal to me that I had to drop some pounds so that was a the banal was important for so many reasons way to break the stereotype of the American overseas guy <laughs> I know I know it's bad so well, one thing, one thing that I think um, it's it's interesting. Uh, some patients, and probably more for both of you than for me, will go online and look me up on the WashU website. And something that patients comment on all the time is where I've traveled and w- what I've seen. So you know, for people that uh, are fortunate enough to do the Banel or any of the other traveling fellowships, but even if you don't, there's value in in going somewhere, learning something. Obviously, for the educational content, but trainees and patients will look up where you've gone and, and what that, uh, that makes them feel better for some reason. I was like, I'm fixing your distal radius fracture. Why do you care that I traveled internationally for nerve stuff? But they, they care. Yeah, it does bring, and I'd love Steve's opinion. It does bring validation when you say that it actually immediately makes me think of kind of flipping it around. It makes you think of Louisville um, and their uh, hand fellowship, which attracts international and has forever well, you know, it's been the mecca of advanced hand training for many years, I think a little less so today than in years past. Uh, but as I understand it, and Steve, you are more well-traveled than I am, and you probably understand this better, but as I understand the importance of Louisville, it was simply that if you were overseas and you were a young academic uh, hand surgeon, sometimes to take the next step, a year spent in Louisville would kind of get you over the hump and advance your career. Um, but like I said, you're more well-traveled. What's your, what's your sense on, on what Chris shared? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I the, the Louisville Fellowship has trained so many remarkable leaders in hand surgery, uh, you know, from Raja Savapathy, Paco Pinal. I mean, really people who have changed hand surgery internationally. I think it's incredible to travel. I tell all the fellows and residents that you got to get out of this country and just get a fresh perspective. I think uh, also, you know, volunteer missions is another place where you see that people can do so much with so little. Um, I think that all those things make you feel a lot smaller, a lot more humble. And uh, I think it's something that everyone should do. And I mean, I think that, you know, the ASSH provides you that opportunity. You can go on outreach missions, but even better, you know, at the meeting, go to the international, join the international uh, committee. You can meet these people and 
uh, you know, they invite yourself over there. They, they'll love to have you. They're as, they're as friendly as, as you guys are. And I think it's just a great way to get out of your little circle of comfort. Yeah, before we jump in, yes, I think that's very well said. Um, of all the work you do, you, you know, with hand surgery and the hand society and, and the board, um, nothing we do is more important than our family. So I want to comment on your sweatshirt and I want you to tell me a little bit more. So uh, for those of you, you know, we all appreciate- I think he was wearing that sweatshirt the last time we recorded too, but I don't think we were on YouTube. Plugging, now, so. plugging the school, <laughs> plugging the school. You know, uh, so Chuck, Chuck and I were a year apart in, uh, in college and uh, we, we often talk about our kids. They're roughly the same age. My, uh, my two oldest are- um, are now full-time musicians. My um, my middle son is at Berkeley, and uh, and he actually will be joining us for uh, the meeting this year. I don't know if you guys know this is a big thing. Jeff has rented out the House of Blues for you know Mark Barrett's hand band extravaganza, Battle of the Bands, and your partner. I should I'm, I'm throwing this out there now. This is going to be everywhere. Marty Boyer and I. We'll be playing with uh, some musicians from the Berkeley School of Music. Last, we will be the last band on. So hopefully there will be most of the people that will still be there will either be too tired to remember or something else. So they won't really remember. Mistakes will be forgotten and uh, we will be playing live. Well, hold, hold on. Time, Dr. Time Boyer. Out. Dr. Boyer, so, leather pants and a cutoff is what I heard you need to hear. <laughs> Uh, I, I had uh, um, Marty over last night, and uh, it's funny enough, one of the kids, his nickname for Uncle Marty is Uncle Party. So we're <laughs> ready to go here. Steve, I think you're, you're trying to promote this event, but I, <laughs> honestly, Marty and leather pants and a cutoff, I think, might keep people away. So let's, <laughs> let's set the record state. So are, people, are, are people able to compete in this battle? Should hand surgeons and hand therapists coming to the hand society kind of get their uh, get their bands ready? Or are we is this a closed competition, professional that, circuit only? That is a good question. And I think Mark Ferris is going to be looking into that. Um, I think that, you know, they, there are several uh, there's several super talented people in the ASSH, and I am a hack. Except, uh, it, the, uh, though Chuck knew that we were quite a quite a famous band in college, this this close to 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 not ever being a hand surgeon, being a professional rock star. But uh, seriously, I think Mark is going to be working on this. I think it's you know it'll just be a good time, just a, a fun time, and to get everyone. When is when can you uh, have the House of Blues all to yourself? I mean, this is going to be fantastic. It, it is going to be great, and uh, you don't tell yourself short. I know you're a talented musician, and and I don't know your wife, but uh, um, I, I don't know if she has musical talent or it's all coming from from you. But your kids have really done remarkable things already. They're they're working on it, or I'm going to be working for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's jump into the content before we lose our listeners. Hopefully, they've enjoyed this banter. Um, so the you know. I did a couple of things. Um, we're, we are here today to discuss proximal row carpectomy and scaphoid excision with four bone fusion as a salvage procedure for whatever ails your wrist. And that could be, um, I don't know if it would be Keenbox necessarily, but it could be Keenbox, obviously, uh, radial sided pathology. So the first thing I did was just search our guest on PubMed. And I have to say, Dr. Moran, it exceeded my expectations. And so I don't know if there's more than one Steve Moran, but 332 cited publications. Um, I, I, can, I feel comfortable saying that's more than, than Chris and I combined. We feel not worthy. Chuck, Chuck I, first of all, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little upset that you haven't read them all. I read all of your articles right before I fall asleep at night. And I, so, but uh, yeah, I, we, you know, you're, you're talking about a subject that I have struggled with for a long time, I have done everything in my power. I don't want to hit the punchline before we get to the end of the podcast, but I've done everything in my power to try to show that proximal row carpectomy is not an ideal operation. And I, you know, I, I don't, these two operations are, are very, uh, people are very passionate about them. They're like your favorite soccer team or football team, you know, where you train tends to be the way that you do things. And I think that um, there's still such a, a lot of debate about them. Well, let me let me toss you a case to you know get things started. 
Um, so on the topic of Keenbox, what about a patient who comes in, say they're uh, mid forties, um, uh, female, and she comes in with wrist pain, you know, all of a sudden it started. Um, can't remember, you know, if, if there was an accident or anything like that, may have fallen on it or something like that. Um, but she comes in and you see that there is pretty advanced Keenbox disease. And you're you're saying, okay, there's a little bit of collapse here. Um, you know, we're starting to see some increase in the radius scaphoid angle. The wrists don't look right. She's having pain. You've tried and you go fast forward. You've tried injections. Um, you know, you've uh, tried an immobilization with a brace, and you've perhaps sent her to do some therapy. She's not better. What's your decision making algorithm now, Chris? That's a good case to start with. You know, I think um, that. Uh, it, it always boils down, where I always start is, you know, what's the minimum requirements for functional wrist motion? And there's a lot of studies that look at that, but I basically boil it down. People need about 40 degrees of flexion extension, 10 degrees of radial deviation, and, and 30 degrees of ulnar deviation. And then what do they do? Um, so if they are a farmer pounding in fence posts every day, that's a lot different than someone that's sitting at a computer programming all day. So I think that always starts with the patient. I, it's, it's still a little individualized for me. Keenbox is one of the conditions for proximal row carpectomy pay, you, that they do very well. So I think that is a really good solution. I mean, I think uh, you want to make sure that there's no arthritis at the lunate facet. The capitate still looks okay, but that's a great option. And it's a quick recovery. You know, if that patient, however, say she you know works on a farm and she does have to put in fence posts every day um then i might offer her a scaphocapitate fusion i i you know I, I know that that's not the, one of the procedures we're talking about today but i do feel that for my manual labor patients that that tends to take pounding a little bit better than a, a prc however the literature states that for keen box proximal carpectomy is a great solution i love that i'm gonna go full chuck mode Two things. So I, I can't remember, Chuck and I talk at so many different venues, whether this was hand conference or on the podcast, but Chuck, you mentioned that not everybody after um, a PRC for Keenbox does well. Why, why do you think that is? And then the second comment I'll make is, Steve, you drove a distinction between the manual laborer versus the, uh, um, uh, the keyboard professional, but the literature may not suggest that that matters as much for a PRC. Um, so anecdotally, uh, do you still believe that? Maybe we'll go to Chuck first, and I want your thoughts on that second uh, comment. So to be clear, I do like proximal row carpectomies for Keenbox. My experience has been in using that as a bailout option. Uh, occasionally, the patient comes in and their Keenbox is so severe, and you know they have arthritis, uh, and as long as it doesn't involve the head of the captate, as Steve said, then then I think a PRC is reasonable. But usually for me, I have done something else first. And maybe that's a vascularized graft, as Dr. Moran taught us. Maybe it is um, Maybe it is simply a shortening of the radius. And if that doesn't lead to improvement, then a proximal carpectomy is often my next step. What's interesting is I have my population uh, definitely skews younger. And there are adolescents certainly with keen box that we treat. And we certainly try really hard not to do a salvage type procedure in an adolescent, but there's a group of them that fail. Uh, and I, you know, my algorithm for the adolescent, not to go down the wrong path here, but I do try to unload them, whether that's a cast or a scaphocapitate pin uh, to unload the, the lunate and give it a chance to heal. Uh, I do use vascularized grafts. I do use radius shortening. Uh, but occasionally all of those fail and a PRC might be appropriate. And I think the results are good. They're just not great in that situation. Steve, I'm certain before you answer Chris, Chris's question, but I'm certain that you've had experience with this same adolescent population. How do you think about them in Keenbox? Yeah, Chuck, I think the same way. You know, I do think we give them all a trial of immobilization. Um, but I do think that... Uh, as you were saying, I'm so hesitant to change the anatomy. I want to do everything I can to keep all the bones in there. And obviously you don't want to fuse a, a young adult. We've, we've had really good results with uh, vascularized grafting in uh, young patients. I think the cases where we don't do a vascularized graft is usually where the lunate cartilage is fractured. Uh, Greg Baines, uh, great 
work to, to look at both sides of the lunate cartilage. So, but if you, if you fail with the vascularized graft, you have every option open to you. You haven't really damaged anything. Um, but, but to uh, Christy, kind of get back to your point, you know, we, we did a study a long time ago where we looked at, it was over 80 patients that were over 15 years out from proximal oral carpectomy. So they had their proximal oral carpectomies a long time ago, like Jim Dobbage, Ron Lynchide time. And the majority of them were, you know, Midwest farmers. And, and uh, 15 years of follow-up, the motion they started with was the motion they ended with. The grip strength was a little less, but roughly the same. But when we sent them a questionnaire and we said, you know, do you have pain in the wrist? Yes, every day. Um, you know, it, I, can't, I couldn't go back to heavy manual labor. Um, but they, but they did never got anything else done for it, which I was so interested about. Are they just afraid of going back to doctors? Um, and then we did another study looking at patients under 45, younger age group that had PRC and four corner fusion. And essentially we found that the results were the same between the two. I was so sure that, you know, um, four corner fusion would be far superior but it wasn't, and uh, we had just as many deteriorations to uh, total wrist fusion, and uh, actually there were more reoperations as you would imagine in four corner fusion for hardware. So, despite my best efforts, I have not been able to show that there's really any benefit over four corner fusion. I was really trained that that was the only way to go. You had to do a four corner fusion. Proximal row carpecting was going to fail, but that uh, doesn't look like that's the case. Now, I want to get back to your scaphicapitate thing in a second, because uh, I think listeners will want to know about that. Um, but, you know, should we be afraid of a PRC in a younger patient? One of our partners, uh, Lindley Walworth, that paper when she was uh, working with Peter Stern in her fellowship, uh, does a PRC work in this youngish patient, or should we shy away from it and try some other procedures? We know you're biased, but. Uh, well, I mean, I'm. I... Dr. Stern has got excellent results. We definitely know that there are things you can do to make a proximal row carpectomy work better. And I think that is, you know, looking, looking for the right patient first off, you know, I think if you have the patient that's got the right job and got the right mindset that they know they're going to still have some pain, but they're going to keep their wrist motion. It's going to be a quicker recovery. And I think setting expectations is critical, but I think there's a lot of little things. Um, doing an AIN, PIN, nerectomy, I think we've shown that that's really, it adds no time at all. I mean, we, we could all say we cut the PIN when we go in there, but I mean, really cutting it out, cutting the AIN out, I think that helps. We've, we've shown that. I think also looking at the shape of the capitate, you know, there's different shapes to that capitate. Some can be very pointed, and Steve Viegas talked about that. But I think if you have one that's more rectangular, the most common type, um, they tend to do better. And, you know, I think if you go in there and there's a lot of osteochondral damage uh, on the head of the capitate already, you can consider doing like a mini oats procedure like uh, Dr. Imbriglia has talked about, just really try to set the patient up as best you can. And, um, and then I think, you know, hopefully if the patient does fail down the road, we'll have some salvage procedures. I, I've certainly salvaged proximal row carpectomies with a variety of different things, whether it be meniscal allograft in the lunate fossa or even cartilage, vascularized cartilage transfers. But these are tend to be heroic attempts. And, and for many patients at that point in their life, they may just want a fusion. So um, I don't want to uh, rewind too much, but I think our listeners would appreciate the technical here, uh, both the surgeons and the non-surgeons who listen. Um, just talk us very briefly through your approach um, and kind of the steps you take to maximize your outcomes. Um, that, that would be helpful for me to hear, I think, for all of us to hear. Sure. So for a proximal row carpectomy patient, you know, once you've, you, you've come to the decision, you're at that fork in the road with the patient. For the proximal row, I, I still use the, the, the ligament sparing capsulotomy as, as taught to us by Dr. Berger. And you know, I, I get in there and I'm, I'm take the lunate out first by just cutting whatever's left of the ligaments. And, and then I, uh, I'll save all the bones and I try to take them out in one piece because they are a good source of cartilage graft if you end up looking or you, you scuff the capitate or something goes wrong. 
and then I take out the triclitrum sharply, and then I will take out the scaphoid. And there's a variety of ways, you know, I think that's the hardest part. You can either put a threaded K wire into it, or, you know, there, there's uh, almost like a corkscrew for a, for a wine uh, bottle that you can put into the scaphoid to kind of pull on it. But I find the, the cob or the magladry um, acetone helps to kind of get around that and, and almost scoop the scaphoid out. And then I make sure that the radioscaphic capitate ligament is still intact. I haven't damaged anything. And then I just plicate the capsule. The one other tip I would say is that as you are taking out the triquetrum, I really try to stay on the periosteum. I certainly have seen patients that have ended up with uh, ulnar sided instability, I think because we're maybe too aggressive around the TFCC and the remaining ulnar carpal ligaments. And then I look at the radiograph to make sure that I'm not gonna end up with styloid impingement onto the hamate later on, which I think can certainly happen. And then I placate the capsule and close. And then for them, it's usually you know three weeks of immobilization, and then I start some general range of motion. If you want, if you want to get into it, we certainly can talk about my technique for four corner fusion. Uh, that's changed a lot over time, but that's how I do approximate microphone. Yeah, I was going to say maybe let's let's finish with uh, this, and then yeah, we should talk about four corner, and then we can talk about the literature. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. I was just going to ask if you're insisting that the carpal bones be removed on block or in one piece, how heavy of a sigh do you release? when your trainee or perhaps yourself ends up, you know, not taking it out in one piece. Oh no, that's, I do suffer from a little ADHD. So, I mean, you know, there, you have to be reasonable about, about the amount of time. I just think you have to take them out carefully. If it's simpler and you're going to be safer taking them out in pieces, take them out in pieces. I don't think that's a problem. I just think it's nice to have one of them intact because I use, if I do have a scuff or I, there's a bad problem with the capitate, I use the little pediatric trephines to like, punch, I'm sure you guys do this too. You just punch out a piece and then you can put it into the capitate like the Imbrigula article. And you don't do it all the time, but I think it just, you have a little bailout in case there's a problem. Well, you had Chuck when you said oats and you had me when you talked about nerves. So I mean, you clearly know your audience, Dr. Moran. <laughs> it, um, it's funny because I thought in response to Chris's question, the answer was going to be, well, we're the Mayo Clinic. It always comes out in one piece. <laughs> We, we don't have those errors they may have at Wash U. Listen, oh, listen, our partner, David Brogan, who trained at Mayo, corrected me saying, you always have to say the world famous Mayo Clinic before world you say brother. Mayo Clinic. Oh, okay. Um, the world infamous, I guess. So is there a role for capsular interposition in a proximal row carpectomy where the cartilage is not perfect? Do you ever use that simple technique? Yeah. So um, that's a great question, Chuck. And, you know, people have done everything with this operation. It's been around since the 1940s. But, you know, Eaton used to take off the head of the capitate so that you had like a smooth surface between the hamate, the capitate, and he left the distal articular surface of the scaphoid um, to have a big broad surface to load share. And, you know, I think it's very um tempting to put something in there. And certainly I've had interpositional material work over time, but when we, and again, the retrospective studies, but when we looked at the results, there's no difference between doing radial styloidectomy, an interposition graft or a capsular flap. Uh, those didn't really uh, affect the long-term outcome. The only thing that did was the, the, nerec the formal neurectomy, PIN, AIN. So quick question before we jump to four corner um, and scaphoid excision. When you talk about, you talked about capsular application, exactly how do you do that? And then we should talk about your post-op protocol after a PRC. I think if you, well, I mean, Chuck, you certainly, uh, if you're going to, if you think you're going to definitely do a capsular flap, then I might consider doing a different exposure to the wrist. You could either have a, a distally based flap that you pulled underneath, or you could need make a proximally based flap that you could just lay in there. But if you if you really think you're going to do a capsular flap, I, I don't think the the Mayo capsulodesis is ideal for that. Um, it's good for exposure, but not for that. So I would probably choose one or the other before I went in. You could even make a very broad radial based flap and then cut it in half and lay half underneath. Uh, but if I'm going to put something in there, I, I usually, unfortunately, will take something off the shelf, um, whether it's meniscal allograft or some decellularized dermal matrix, because I like the ability to plicate that uh, capsule down to kind of take up the redundancy uh, from losing the proximal carpal row. 
And you're just talking about uh, over tightening the capsule just to get get some tension back. That's right, Chuck, just to get a little bit of tension back, particularly on the ulnar aspect of the carpus. Okay, that's super helpful. And so you uh, always perform a PIN and AIN neurectomy in this situation. I do now. Yep, I do now. It's interesting because I have not. And while my results are, you know, I trained at, uh, um, with, with Peter Cern, as you, as you mentioned, and uh, Peter felt and feels very strongly that uh, the PRC is a great operation. Not everyone agrees, as we all know. And, and uh, m- my partner, Marty Boyer, has never been a big fan. Um, it has been interesting to kind of watch the evolution and thought. And I think more and more people are appreciative of the PRC and recognize some of the challenges with the four corner. But there clearly is a role for the four corner as well. So, Steve, when do you think about performing a four corner instead of a PRC? So, and again, I'll admit my bias here. I, I was kind of trained that the capitate is bigger than the lunate fossa. So, I mean, you know, the capitate sits, you know, it shares half of its articulation with the scaphoid and the, and the lunate. And then you drop this larger sphere into this usually rectangular fossa. And what's going to happen? You're going to get load uh, edge wear, essentially. Um, and, and then you have shearing over these bumps. So, you know, and, and we know it doesn't always correlate with outcome, but if you follow these patients, after 10 years, they all have degenerative changes at the capital lunate interface. So that that just like it it makes it makes me uncomfortable. Um, but despite that, again, I haven't ever been able to show that it's a bad operation. Uh, for, so for four corner fusion, I would go with the patient that is okay with having longer immobilization, is okay with losing more flexion. Um, I think, you know, uh, in, in is willing to accept the fact that we may have to go out, uh, go into either fix a non-union or take out hardware. So we know... Um, the literature says that it's you know it's more expensive to do four corner fusion. Yeah, it's it's not as cost effective for OR time either, and there's a higher risk of secondary surgery. So I tend to do the surgery now with just two compression screws. I think there's a strong argument that can be made maybe for um, doing it as minimally invasive as you can, so you don't uh, destroy any blood supply of the carpal bones. But I usually uh, take the scaphoid out and morselize it and prepare the cartilage and uh, or remove the cartilage and then use that as bone graft. And then I place a compression screw from the triquetrum uh, into the capitate. Some, sometimes it goes through the hamate. And then I place one, uh, fr- I put a, a K wire down either between the CMC joint of the index and long finger or the long and ring. And one of those, if you look at the x-ray ahead of time, that space is one of those will be axial with the capitate and the lunate. And then we put a, a compression screw in there. And if you can do that, you can't always, sometimes you got to use a, additional staples or something else. The patients usually do very well because you haven't done a tremendous amount of violation of the soft tissues. So interesting, a couple of uh, things that you do differently. I'd like to follow up on those. So you place your own, I also use two screws. You place your owner screw first. Now, is that screw through a separate mid ulnar incision or is that through your dorsal incision? No, yeah, thanks, Chuck. I, I make a little stab incision here and just pass uh, uh, cannulated, uh, the K wire with the cannulated screw. And that's what I do. Chris has taught me that we're both being silly and there's a better way. Well, um, no, I mean, I think, I, I think that it's, it's interesting. Why do you do the... Um, why do you do that screw first? Because I actually think of, and maybe I'm thinking about this incorrectly, and I'd love to learn. I should think about that fusion as the uh, the afterthought, as opposed to the capital lunate. Uh, that, that's that's a great question. I'm going to take a little sidebar. I just I don't know if you guys have noticed that I do have two cups here today because this cup is just too small. So I want to be a sponsor, so we can get, get. I have to pour from this cup into this cup. This is your cup. I love your cup. Um, Chuck, Chuck, I'm almost empty. I actually had to refill uh, er, earlier. I can't believe a guest is disparaging our coffee not, cups. I love the cup. I love it. It, it. I love it. I told you my wife loves it. It's right size for tea. But like on a long discussion like this, you need a lot of coffee. Anyways, sorry. Get back to your point, Chris. You know, you got. I got all these K wires in there, right, to stabilize everything. 
And you're right, that fusion is probably not necessary. But I, I think the screw that goes from the capitate to the lunate, you get one shot. If that screw, if you're putting a compression screw in there, and you, you know, I think just so many things can go wrong. I like to have something fixed, a bigger target. Um, everything else is squared, squared away. So I just have to tighten that one screw and then I can be done. I do think that um, if you're using these compression screws, they, they take up a lot of space in the inside of the lunate, which is a bone that uh, I certainly have created Keenbox disease in by putting in these screws. I don't know, Chuck, if you want to talk about that at all. But, um, but you know, so I just, I want to be careful. So that's why I do it that way. How much do you endeavor to prepare um, the joint surfaces aside from, I mean, so are you doing the side-to-side -side joint surfaces? Or are you also doing the triquetrum and the hamate? Or are you just kind of putting the screw in to stabilize things? Uh, well, you know, I think that probably all the problems we've seen with the circular plate uh, are because we're not paying attention to the carpentry. I really do take a lot of time to uh, denude the bone between the four surf the capitate lunate and the triquetrum and the hamate. Uh, in between the bones, I, I will do a little bit between the uh, triquetrum and the lunate, but uh, not so sometimes between the hamate and the capitate, but that's a very stout ligament. So I don't spend a tremendous amount of time there. But I will, you know, if it's sclerotic, I'll, I'll put drill holes in and then, you know, I really will pack it full of bone before I compress down the screws. I, I do think that joint preparation is critical. Yeah, certainly agree. You know, we, we, we haven't gotten into some of the details, nor do we need to, um, but I always go antegrade um, with my screw from the lunate to the captate. The reason I do that is you know, the lunate is a very, you know, from a proximal distal standpoint, it's not a long bone. And so getting the wider part of the screw there, just like we treat a proximal pole of the scaphoid from dorsal, I try to, I, that's how I think about it. I've also had a more difficult time with attempted retrograde screws, but I like your pearl uh, longitudinally, not trying to come from the dorsum of the capitate, trying to come from distal to proximal truly does make sense. Um, I think that's really interesting. I, I will think about that more. Um, thanks for sharing that. And, but, you know, just, we looked at all types of fixation, Chris, no, dif no difference in outcomes, but it doesn't matter what I say. You should just do it however it's easiest and safest for you. And that's probably the most important thing. So I, I am part of a, a travel club and we've talked about, you know, and some have have trained at Mayo and some have trained elsewhere. And we, we talk about choice of fixation here. You know, convince me to use headless compression screws as opposed to the sexy plate. Oh, I, I can't, I can't. I just think, um, you know, that some people, gosh, you know, one of my partners, Alex Shin, that, that guy can put that plate on in like five minutes and he always gets great results. And um, I think it's just whatever you're comfortable with. I have, having seen patients come in from elsewhere, I, you know, you certainly see plenty that come in with prominent hardware, with non-unions, with screws that go into the piezotriquetral joint, you know, all kinds of things with those plates. And I, you know, I, I just think after, have, you know, Dr. Gelderman was a, a big influence on my research, as you guys know, and looking at the blood supply to the lunate, there's not that much blood supply in that bone. And I really feel if I'm like firing screws in there and reaming off the 50% of the dorsal surface, yeah, I can't, I can't sleep very well. So I have to, um, I, I think I'd just rather put one compression screw in. Yeah, like anything, I mean, you know, if you are technically proficient um and get the results you and your patients hope for keep doing it that way but i'm, I'm with you I, I i think screws uh make a lot of sense um before we shift i think we should briefly highlight the literature are there any other technical pearls uh either steve or chris that we should touch on uh prior to shifting gears and talking briefly about the literature i think the post-op protocols are super important here too um so i mean if you want to share your post-op protocols uh both of you for each prc and four corner that probably would be of interest to our surgeons and our therapists that are listening yeah steve take us from you said you cast the prc for three weeks which is shorter than some uh our partner lindley wall agrees with you she does more prcs than i think chris and i uh do and she loves uh, the the three-week uh mobilization what are the expectations after that? Do you splint? Uh, how aggressive do you get with your motion? And when do you tell them they can be hammering fence posts if that's what they need no. to do? 
Yeah. So uh, for so you heard what we do with the proximal carpectomy, uh, you know, and, and we still give them after those three weeks, they certainly are in charge of wearing their wrist splint whenever they need to for discomfort. Um, but for the four corner fusion, the one quick thing I want to say before we uh, leave the technical pearls, you know, we do always recommend flexing down the wrist and correcting the DC before you get too far in your procedure. So that one pin, um, which we call the lynch eyed pin here because you're correcting the, the DC, keeps the, the lunate in a proper position because we all know that if you end up fusing with that lunate in extension, the postoperative wrist motion is really uh, ruined. And for a manual laborer, getting the wrist back in extension is key for maximizing grip strength. So, okay, but having said that, they are now in a cast um, at least for six weeks in like maybe eight, because I'm, I'm still, even though I have compression screws in there, I still really want them to show some signs of healing. So that's just a longer rehab for me. And, and then I let them, you know, at two months, they start doing range of motion and I'll let them go back to heavy manual labor when they feel that they are, uh, relatively pain-free for like, if they want to do a fence post, that's pretty significant, uh, throttling of the wrist, but if they feel up to it, they could go back at three to four months. That's super helpful. So you're, and obviously you're leaving some of this to the patient, but from a proximal row carpectomy standpoint, it sounds like by six or eight weeks, you're letting them go. But for a four corner, it's looking more like four months for, for the heavier task. Does that sound right? Yes. And, you know, obviously my PA should be here because when I leave the room, she obviously tells them the real story. I mean, she, she was, she's like pushing me out the door so that she can say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me tell them what's really going on here. But I think that um, if I'm being conservative, it's probably, you know, you're moving your hands and your wrist and you go back to things. But if you're really trying to like, you know, fix the tractor, change the power takeoff and all these things, then I think it's going to be about four months. So let's just briefly, and I think we should wind down and we're grateful you joined us here for uh, another pod. Um, what I think is interesting about the literature on PRC versus scaphoid excision and full bone fusion is for me at least, and you guys may both correct me, um, you know, I was finishing my training in 2001, uh, well after Dr. Moran, and um, the, the article from uh, Scott Cozen and Mark Cohen, Cohen came yeah. out, yeah. Uh, which, which really was the one for me at least that set the, that really kind of informed my thought process for a while, which is, it's now changed, but basically it said younger manual labor, four corner, older, lower demand PRC by comparing their two practices. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on that kind of precedent setting paper, which is in the journal of hand surgery. Um, and then your thoughts on the evolution of our understanding, because you've contributed a lot to that evolution. Yes. Chuck, we were in the same uh, fellowship class. So, I mean, yes, I, we read the same paper. And of course, you've got two great surgeons there. You, you know, Mark Cohen can like fix a scapoid that's like in 50 pieces. I mean, you know, the guy's a, he's a, he's a great surgeon and Scott Cozen goes without saying, I mean, those guys are phenomenal surgeons. What you're not seeing there is what they told the patients ahead of time. You know, I think that, that setting up the expectations and who you're going to choose to do these operations on is critical. One of the things we looked at like 150 proximal row carpectomies to figure out what was the predictor of a good outcome was the surgeries done after 1990. And, you know, could it be different techniques? But I think we knew at that time we had two good options and we're choosing the patients more appropriately. So, you know, there are patients you're going to go in on, you're planning to do a four corner fusion, you're going to go in there and the lunate's going to be toast, or I mean, it, it's very unusual, but like in a bad VC, you know, you, they can get uh, all the cartilage can be worn off the bottom and, and you got to do a proximal carpectomy. So, you know, I think you have to be prepared for both. I really try to individualize it to the patient, but I think in broad strokes, what they found in that paper when that was published holds true for me today. I mean, that's, that's my two major categories. You're right. Maybe I'll just close in saying what, what it's been remarkable how much literature has come out on this topic and whether it's Nick Kazmierz, who's at Utah, talking about cost assessment, uh, your work uh, on younger patients. But it really, to me, has become more clear that it is absolutely crystal clear that the cost 
Uh, we all know cost matters, but the four corner is more expensive, more likely to require a revision surgery um, compared to PRC. Uh, we know that younger patients do just fine with PRCs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it is, it's still a choice that we as surgeons make, um, but the choice kind of how to categorize that choice is what's changed. And I think I have a better understanding of who will do well and what other factors to consider. So uh, that's, that's my take, Chris. I don't know what your take on the literature is. It's interesting to hear uh, two grandpas talk about you know, the literature when it came out. <laughs> But it's also interesting to know that both of you have contributed a lot to um, to this uh, particular topic, and you still believe the findings of the Cozen and Cohen paper. I mean, that's super interesting. I'm not saying that either, you know, whether in a good way or a bad way. I think that's interesting because, you know, there is a lot of power in kind of that um, level five experience and, you know, seeing how the literature may apply to your practice. Um, I, I want to ask one question of each of you before we uh, close. What's the shelf life of a PRC? Chuck, are you going to go first? You, well, you're our guest. I'd like okay. you to have that opportunity. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I, you know, in that paper we wrote back in 2011, some of those patients were, were 19 years out. They had the same, you know, the same motion before and after. I mean, the shelf life, I guess, is when the patient has pain and tells you they want you to, take, to fix it. But I mean, it, it can last a long time. It, I remember I presented that paper, um, at the at the ASSH to at the IWIW wrist associators workshop and Kirk Watson said well nothing lasts forever you know and is 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 that is that should we say that I mean shouldn't we try to give the patient one operation last the rest of their life we can't I don't think we can do that yet I think what I would like to say in summary uh, before we go to Chuck because he should always have the last word I think that we <laughs> we don't have a perfect solution that's what we should say about all this is that, you know, you young people out there, you residents and fellows who listen to this podcast all the time, uh, should think of a better way to fix this problem, whether that's with uh, cartilage grafts or stem cells or exosomes or better arthroplasty. There needs to be another solution that is outside the box. Got to travel the world to, to, to maybe see the solution. But I think that's, uh, that's what we're really looking at here. We have an imperfect, we have an okay, but an imperfect solution to this problem. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I don't have much to add. The only thing that I don't think we've mentioned, which is important, is that clinical outcome and radiographic outcome are different. And then we know at 20 years, most patients with the PRC are likely to be doing well. Just don't x-ray them because you're going to see arthritis. <laughs> um, and we don't need to know that is, is the reality. I, I'll, I will close by saying, you know, it was great to see. I saw Steve, God, I think it was last weekend uh, for, this, for this conference we mentioned. And I was really hoping to catch up at dinner. Uh, that didn't work out. Steve's very popular and people were flocking to sit at his table. And, uh, but I do feel like I caught still up put me at the kitty table. I want you to know that there's like, there's a big table for all the professors and then there's a small table and that's where I usually am. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like we caught up today. So I'm, I'm so glad you came on both to educate me and just to catch up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. And thank you again for what you're doing. I think so many people love this. I, you know, I was very skeptical, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really doing well. So congratulations and gosh, keep it. I know it's a lot of work for you guys and uh, keep it up. Tell me when you want the check so we can get some bigger mugs. <laughs> All right, okay. well, we'll take you up on that one. Yeah, if you send me another one, then I can have two and then they'll never know that I'm refilling the coffee cup because I'll just pick the other one up. It'll be a little colder, but it's okay. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Steve. I'm gonna go get a refill on my coffee. <laughs> yeah, ha have a great day, guys. Thanks so much for having me. All right, take care.